and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. Find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron. Please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I am super excited that we're going to be speaking to Emily Pennington. Emily is a writer, adventurer, climber, and comfort zone smasher. Emily is a big fan of the just get out there and do it mentality. She loves inspiring others to go outside, travel, and get curious about everything. Emily's going to be sharing more about hiking in Nepal, backpacking in California, and trekking in Iceland. So my name is Emily Pennington. You'll probably find me online with the handle Brazen Backpacker, which is my my alter ego when I'm hiking and doing adventures. And I am an outdoor writer. Uh, I'm an avid hiker. I've been trying to slowly but surely knock down a big list of kind of like bucket list mini through hikes. So I've done the Annapurna Circuit, the Inca Trail. I just did the Laga Vega Trail in Iceland, and I've done the High Sierra Trail which is incredible, and it traverses the Sierra Nevadas in California. And um, I'm based in Los Angeles, and I try to get up in the Sierra Nevadas or in the mountains whenever I can. Where does the brazen backpacker alter ego come from? It's a, it's kind of a side project that I started about three and a half years ago when I was going through a pretty life-shattering breakup, and um, I felt like the best cure would be to get out in the mountains more and also give myself a huge writing project and a creative project to kind of bolster myself back up. And so I came up with this brazen backpacker idea, and the whole the whole idea behind it is that you you can go out on your own, you can do solo hikes, you can jump in an alpine lake naked, like you can do these like big gestures um and still still retain your femininity and still um like I still work a nine to five office job like you can still you can have both and and so the idea was was to showcase that element of brazenness and wildness that I think everyone has inside them even though we might have to hide it when we're inside a city were you quite this this is gonna come out really weird like were you quite brazen (laughs) and quite wild then when you were younger yes absolutely I um I moved to Los Angeles when I was 17 to go to college, and um, I've always been involved in storytelling and the arts, so I was a theater major, and I also studied film, and um, I actually am about to go to Burning Man. It's my fifth year, so that's pretty that's pretty brazen right there. I went four times in my early 20s and then took a seven-year break, so that's really exciting and kind of wild, and um, I didn't do a ton of outdoorsy stuff when I was growing up, but we did go to a few national parks and I think more so my brazenness came from this desire to challenge the status quo and challenge the norm. I think my mother is someone I really look up to and she's constantly taking things with a grain of salt. And I think that she really instilled that in me. I, I, I tend to always question things and, and if there's something I want to do, I'll question why it's not the norm and, I'm, and usually just go out and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. What was it like moving to LA at 17? That must have been uh, scary and amazing but also like awesome as well at the same time yeah it was it was actually it was really cool I was I was pretty ready to get out of Texas I grew up in suburban Houston which um, for anyone who's familiar with Texas knows is pretty conservative um, it's a really lovely place if you want to raise a family it's very stable you can get a house for very cheap I think the job market is really good but from the perspective of someone who knows that they want to go off and be an artist, I was feeling really stifled and I was really excited to, to get to an even bigger city. So moving here at 17 was a huge leap of faith and uh, definitely really scary because I didn't know anyone here. But I think having having college as a bit of a, what's it called, a foundation and a, a landing pad was really, really helpful. And And then, of course, I got impatient again and finished college and only three years and jumped out when I was 20 and then decided to swan dive into the real world. (laughs) Living in LA, like opportunities for adventure and the outdoors, when did that start to play more of a role in your life? It really, really started to become a huge part of how I spend my free time. When I was about 28 years old, um, it's really funny because Los Angeles has tons of hiking and there's, there's mountains literally just 
maybe 10 miles to the north of where I am currently sitting right now. But it's, it's amazing how if you don't grow up doing it and your friends don't, don't really hike or backpack all that often, the mental barrier for access can be, can feel like this huge wall that's insurmountable. And so it wasn't really until I was dating this guy for a couple of years who was an Eagle Scout. So he grew up doing this all the time. That was really when uh, he took me on my first backpacking trip. And I, I realized how accessible it was as, as long as you have basically a backpack, a sleeping bag and a tent. In theory, you could just go and, and eat random food from the grocery store. So um, I started wanting to go all the time. I started bringing girlfriends on treks with me. That's the breakup that I ended up mentioning that started this huge brazen backpacker overhaul of my life. And um, yeah, I guess it just it just kind of skyrocketed from there. Do you remember the first time that you went out on a hike when you were when you were 28, like your first backpacking trip? I absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> I um, like I said, I, I went to a few national parks as a kid, so I definitely hiked. Um, I grew up uh, in musical theater, so I, I was always a very physical kid. I did a lot of dance, I did a lot of gymnastics and things like that. But when I was about 28 is when I went on my first backpacking trip with with this guy, and it was in Sequoia National Park. I later learned that he did not know that it was my first backpacking trip. So he decided that we were going to do this huge hike up to this mountain called Alta Peak, which is, I think, 11,200 feet above sea level. Um, so that's, I think, a little over 3,000 meters for, for you Europe people. <laughs> and um, I remember feeling like the oxygen was just sucked out of my body. And I, I didn't really understand what altitude was yet. So I was really perplexed at how slowly I had to move going uphill. And um, I felt like I felt like a very a poorly balanced tortoise, you know, with this huge pack on my back. And, um, and then by the time we got to the, the summit of this mountain, you get this huge panoramic view of the Great Western Divide. And you can see these little snow-capped peaks all around you that are even taller than than where you are sitting. And I was just immediately hooked. And after summiting, we went back down and then kind of traversed along this trail to this campsite called Alta Meadow. And it was, I think, early September, so there were still a few wildflowers out. And we saw the most amazing sunset that I'd ever seen. And I just remember feeling... It felt so ancient and essentially human to to be able to go far out into the woods and only have the things that you need on your back and sleep in these amazing wild natural spaces. And so I just was instantly hooked and wanted to get more of it. What an introduction to hiking! Like, <laughs> yeah. no, not yeah. the not the and easiest. In our store for three days. <laughs> I'm not surprised, like, Alta Peak, 3,000 meters, never been at altitude, like, challenging. But how did how did your sort of, your, your hiking progress? Was it then sort of doing, you know, doing the, the hikes with the boyfriend? Did you ever sort of go out on, on solo expeditions? Did you go out with, like, female friends? How did you start to incorporate it more into your life? Yeah, so, actually, it's funny because I think I was so hooked after that first trip that I instantly wanted to go backpacking even more often than this guy. So I think it was maybe my, definitely my third or fourth backpacking trip ever was a solo trip because I was so gung ho about getting out and challenging myself and, and seeing if, even if I could do it solo and if I would freak out or if, or if it would be awesome. And, um, so I think a few months after that first hike, it was holidays. So I, of course, I wished for only outdoor gear <laughs> for Christmas and got a few things that I really, really needed, like a tent and a sleeping bag and pad. And then as soon as the snow started melted, melting and it wasn't freezing outside anymore, I did this really cool 10 mile each way solo hike up to these hot springs in Big Sur on the coast of California. And that was amazing. I was pretty conscious about choosing a more popular trail where I knew, I knew I would be seeing a lot of other hikers, so I'd feel more comfortable solo, which I think is a really good piece of advice for anyone who's curious about solo backpacking. I think it can be done safely, and I think that there are ways to dip your toe in without just being plopped into the woods alone with bears. <laughs> and um, from there, I just fell even more in love with it and started bringing um, girlfriends who were interested backpacking and um, 
I think it was about two years later that I did the Inca Trail with my mom. So um, it's been really cool to get to to not only do it by myself and with people that I'm dating, but also pull in fabulous women from different parts of my life and, and see how they experience it as well. Emily, I really love how you can see like the, the progress of your journey and how you've got into hiking and, and, and backpacking. What is it about hiking? What is it about being outdoors? What is it that you love so much? Why do you want to, to get other women out there hiking and being able to experience this? Well, I think there's definitely there's definitely a few reasons. One of them, I think, is transforming the notion of body positivity. I was someone who had an eating disorder in college um, for about three years. Thankfully, it was never horrible. I was never hospitalized. It wasn't that bad in theory, but you know, but it was still a big part of my life. And um, becoming more athletic and really owning the power that your muscles and your body can have has transformed the way my mind thinks about things like body weight or shape when I look in the mirror. And so I think that especially for women, especially considering that we get bombarded with so many different advertisements telling us that we're not good enough or we're not thin enough or we're not eating the right things. Um, I think it's, it's imperative to have something that makes you feel strong in your own skin. And I think that, that going on outdoor adventures is one of the surest and quickest ways to get that, that kind of lightning bolt download from the, from the universe. I also think that a lot of things in city society can be really gendered and expectations put on men versus women can differ. And I think that nature doesn't care. Nature doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. It, it mostly just cares if you're competent or if you know how to pitch your tent and filter your water. So I think that breaking down those barriers to a really, really core level where you're only worried about your food, your shelter, and your water and walking in a straight line um, for multiple hours a day um, I think that there's something really sacred and, and kind of ancient and, and transformative about that as well. I also think that the way that the, this is changing, thank goodness, uh, in recent years, but I think that, that we still have a long way to go in the way that media portrays women. So I feel like getting to be dirty and be a tomboy and run around and sleep in the dirt and, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And you get to see yourself as this kind of like wild, feral, strong, you know, mammal. (laughs) Um, I think that that is really powerful as well, because um, I think in the city, women are a bit more valued for their appearance and, and perhaps even their intellect and other great things. But I think that there's like this raw, essential physical element that that's incredibly empowering that you can only get in the outdoors or maybe through sports. I love those words like wild, feral, strong. Like, <laughs> I mean, on my hiking trips, I do go really feral sometimes. <laughs> you just end up being <laughs> so dirty and smelly, but you do feel strong and you do feel empowered. And it is amazing to get out into, into the wilderness. You mentioned before about doing the Inca trail with your mum. Tell me more about the relationship with your mum. My mother is actually an immigrant from Sweden. She moved to the U.S. all by herself when she was about 21 years old. So similar to me running away to college at 17. Um, So I guess I take after my mom in that way. I was really lucky because she's a Swedish citizen. I was lucky enough to get dual citizenship and get to travel to Europe with her um, once every year or two when I was growing up. So I had a very multicultural upbringing. Um, I got to go to lots of art museums and go on like weird hikes in the Swedish wilderness and run around like boulder hopping. As long as I was home by dinner time, I was I was allowed to run around to the woods a little bit um, a couple of summers. So that was amazing. My mom and dad got divorced when I was very, very young. From my point of view, it's always just kind of been like me and my mom against the world. And because we went traveling together so often, we have this history of going on these big adventures together, even if they're city adventures, like traveling around Amsterdam or exploring London together. So as soon as I started backpacking and my mom suggested that she take me on this big trip to Peru for my 30th birthday, I said, okay, awesome. I would love to do Machu Picchu with you, but I have one ask. And that is that we actually hike in and do the four day trek. And so she was understandably a little bit trepidatious. I think her first question was, well, where do I go to the bathroom? (laughs) 
And I was like, I don't, I don't know, like behind a tree. <laughs> then a sh- short Google search did inform us that there are actually bathrooms at each of the campsites. So she was put, put at ease. And um, we ended up having this really incredible, but very rainy four day trek through the Andes mountains in Peru. Uh, you start, I think at about 8,500 feet, you start pretty high up. You start at high altitude right off the bat. And um, day two, you go over this pass called Dead Woman's Pass, and it's about 13,800 feet above sea level, I think. So pretty high. It was really amazing to see to see my mom, who's not a huge camper, but who is adventurous, you know, very slowly, but with a very determined mindset, work her way up this, this really high altitude trail while it was pouring rain and the, the stone stairs are really slippery. And it was really incredible. And also the sense of accomplishment when we finally got to Machu Picchu was also really, really special because, because, you know, it's, you know, your parents are only going to be around for so long and there, there's only, there's only so many years that you have where you're both strong enough to do these huge adventures. And so it was, I was really grateful to be able to share that experience with her. What do you think you learned most about having that experience with your mom and, you know, reflecting back now on it and doing it? Honestly, I think it was really fantastic to get to see how accessible a lot of these seemingly huge adventures are. My mom is in really good shape. Like she's run a couple of half marathons, but by no means is she like a professional athlete. And she, and she, like I said, she, you know, lived in Texas at the time. Um, so it's not like she had huge mountains to go training in. And she, you know, she crushed it. I think that it was really amazing to see how, I think having the right mindset and having the determination to just keep putting one foot in front of the other is everything when it comes to, to mountaineering or going on big through hikes. I think a lot of the time it's really just getting into the right headspace. And so it was really cool to see her just sheer will get her up and over these huge mountain passes on this group trek that we went on. Tell me more about some of your other hikes. So I think you've done like quite a variety of, of, of different hikes and you know mini through hikes as well. Which sort of hikes stand out for you or how do you choose which adventure you're going to go on next? Okay, start with the first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a huge, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm a big alpine nerd. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of anything that goes above 10,000 feet, especially, especially in the Sierras. Um, I recently did the Annapurna circuit, which I think I want to say almost over half of it takes place above 10,000 feet, which is, which is amazing. And, um, I'm, I'm a sucker for, I'm a sucker for really great views as well. So if I had to pick like a favorite one or two through hikes or mini through hikes, I would say the high Sierra trail is incredible. Most people can complete it in about seven days. It goes up and over the great Western divide, which is in California in the Sierra Nevadas. And um, it's almost entirely in Sequoia National Park. It ends on top of Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the contiguous United States, the lower 48. It is amazing. Um, you start in this, this huge forest of old growth sequoia trees. I think like a mile into the hike, you're spit out onto this like ridge line that has these expansive canyon views of the Cahuilla River. And then you start climbing up and over these passes and you, you pass by these huge sapphire alpine lakes. And um, there's a hot spring, I think like 24 miles in, which is incredible because somehow there's this stone bathtub in the middle of nowhere and you're the only person in it. And it's so magical. Um, then you begin this long, slow climb for two or three days up to the top of Mount Whitney. Um, and the view from, from there is really incredible as well because it's, it's a very prominent mountain. So I think it sticks up about 10,000 feet higher than the desert floor below it. And then you go down, down, down for miles and miles for about 6,000 feet till you get to the trailhead. And then, you know, you have a friend pick you up or hopefully you shuttle the car. Um, So that one's really, really incredible. And then also the Annapurna Circuit, I would highly recommend to anyone who's interested in through hiking. That one's really cool because you get to stay in these little guest houses. So you're staying in these tiny little villages, many of which are only accessible by foot. So there's literally no cars um, or industry in the villages except for farming. 
you can you can kind of pick and choose. There's a section that does not have a road at all. So that section you definitely have to have to do. But you can kind of pick and choose how much of it you want to do because it is possible to hire a Jeep to shuttle you around. So my partner and I did two weeks of it last year um, in November. It's really just massive, like the scale of the the land in Nepal and in the Himalayas. Um, you start off in this very tropical feeling, waterfall filled, almost like a rainforest, very, very green with a lot of river crossings on these really kind of scary suspension bridges that are meant for, for pedestrians to walk across these huge rivers. And then you start to climb up and um, up and up towards this pass. You stay in these tiny little towns along the way. You're passing yaks, like goats. And um, there's all these amazing Tibetan Buddhist monasteries because um, a lot of Tibetans are in exile in India and Nepal. So there are these like really amazing multi-hundred-year-old relics and temples that you get to see. And you pass by just like the most immense glaciers and these mountains that are like, I don't even know. I think you pass by three different 8,000 meter peaks. It's just really magical. So that's one I would I would also say went down in in my history books <laughs> what was the biggest challenge from that experience for some reason Sarah I have a I have the worst habit of getting sick and getting my period at the same time on through hikes <laughs> and I'm sure you can I'm sure you can commiserate yeah. with me because I know you, you've done the Appalachian Trail <laughs> so of course I was I was you know almost at my worst the day that we had to go over this almost 18,000 foot pass, which is the highest I've ever been. It's the highest walking pass in the world. So there's a good several mile stretch where it feels like you're moving through molasses because you just don't even have any oxygen. And so you're just kind of trudging along, like trying to listen to music on your iPhone or like putting one foot in front of the other, breathing really heavily. And um, I'm just, you know, popping ibuprofen like it's candy and then I, of course, burst into tears the second that I actually got to the pass because I was so freaked out and wasn't sure if I was going to randomly collapse on the trail because I was not feeling great at that point in time. And then, of course, the moment we we went over the pass, I started like sprinting to get down to a lower altitude where I could actually breathe. And it was a very, very challenging but very rewarding day, ultimately. How did you get past that? Because when you're when you're trudging along... You're feeling ill, you're on your period, you're emotional, you're not feeling great, and yet you've got to keep going. Like mentally, what's happening inside? When I'm going through moments like that, and I've definitely had a few, I try to I try to kind of shrink everything down to a manageable size. So I might focus on, for example, one thing I like to do is like put on music because as fun as it is to hike in the natural landscape and hear the birds or whatever, whatever's all around you, sometimes you really just need to put your head down and go. So focusing on like little comforts like music or, you know, purposely playing your favorite songs to keep you motivated, that can be really, really helpful. Also paying attention to and or joking with other people who are on the trail with you is a huge morale booster for me at least because I'm an extrovert. So there was this kid, Paul, who is actually from the UK, who we met at one of the guest houses earlier in the trip. And he he was listening to music and passed my, my current boyfriend and I, and he was like dancing in slow motion and passing us. And we were at like 17,000 feet. We were really high up at this point. And I just remember cracking up because like, I suddenly realized like it, it can often seems it can often feel so consequential and so dour and, and huge because you're on this expedition. But at the same time, like like why not make light of it? Like we're we're lucky enough to get to be here and, and privileged enough to get to travel. So so why not just laugh at how absurd the discomfort is? So I think focusing on a focusing on things like that generally helps me get through those really tough moments. So you've got some great articles on your website, uh, thebraidsofbackpacker.com, about the basics of backpacking. Do you just want to share like a couple of your of your top tips, whether that's on how to plan a trek, how to train for a trek, what gear to take? You know, where do women start? What are the basics of backpacking? Absolutely. So yeah, I wrote a series of four posts on my website 
because um, I have so many friends who are constantly coming to me asking different questions about what gear to pick or how do they start training. So I figured like, okay, I'm just going to like take the time, write a few articles, and then I can point people to those links whenever they ask me a, a really detailed question. So first of all, I know one of the biggest barriers of entry for a lot of my friends who ask me about backpacking who are new is about gear because it can be really expensive. It can, it can easily feel like you have to spend one to $2,000 to get started. And so one of my favorite tips to give people is there's this great website called steepandcheap.com, which has brand new like backpacking gear from all the top brands, but it's generally discounted. I want to say like 70, 25 to 70% off. So that place is great. There's also a lot of Facebook groups that I think they vary by state and by country, but there are a lot of like backpacking gear flea market or use backpacking gear Facebook groups. Um, and a lot of people are very active on those. So if you keep an eye out, you can get a really good deal sometimes on a pack or a tent or something that you need. Tip number one is don't be afraid of the cost prohibitiveness of backpacking because there are workarounds if you're clever. Tip number two would be, and this might seem like really, really geeky, but um, I think it's really important when you're first starting to go backpacking or go hiking to pay attention to how many miles the trail is and how long it takes you to do it. And that's because later when you're planning, for example, an overnight trip, you really need to know how long it's going to take you to do 10 miles or 12 miles or however long you're doing that day, especially with weight on. Because let's say there's a thunderstorm rolling in in the afternoon. If you know you can wake up and start at seven in the morning and finish your miles for the day by noon, you know, you can be safely warm inside your tent reading your Kindle or your book and not be out in, in you know, in a potentially dangerous situation. So I think that it seems maybe a little bit superfluous or, or geeky to, to chart, chart out your speed and your miles per hour. But I think that in the long run, knowing those little nuances of how you perform in the mountains are really crucial the more you start to, to plan bigger treks. I would say my third favorite piece of advice to give people that's in basics of backpacking is always pack face wipes. That's my absolute favorite thing. <laughs> That's my like one luxury that I pack on the trail. And it is, it is like night and day in my little heart when I get to like zip up myself into my tent and, and wipe down like my face and maybe my armpits at the end of the day. <laughs> I feel so much cleaner and so much better about my life when I'm not sticky. <laughs> It's definitely the little things that um, that work. I would do the face wipe. I'd do my start on my face, then I'd do my armpits, and then I'd just I'd use the rest on my feet. <laughs> yep, yep, feet or crotch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never go crotch though. <laughs> like, and after I've done my face, I'd be like, oh no, I'd have to get a fresh wipe. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me about this summer. What hikes have you been going on this summer? Wow, um, this summer I got so lucky. As you know, I've been doing a lot of online writing a lot of outdoor writing for smaller, small to medium websites for the last few years. And then this year, all of a sudden, everything exploded, which is so exciting. I started writing more for Outside Magazine, Backpacker Magazine, and Modern Hiker, which is a huge website here in California, as well as this other one that I just started writing for called Territory Supply, which is also awesome and also has a lot of hiking guides. So basically, my summer got kind of co-opted by trails that I quote unquote have to hike for work, which is the best problem to have. <laughs> so um, I've been doing a lot of stuff in the Sierras. I've been doing a big series of trail guides of Alpine lakes, especially near Mammoth in California. And then most recently um, I did do for my own, for my own pleasure uh, with my boyfriend, I did a hike in Iceland about a month ago called the Laga Vegar Trail, which a lot of people put on lists of like the top 10 hikes in the world. And so we were lucky enough to plan ahead and, and get all of the huts booked about six months ago. And um, we went on this amazing seven day little mini through hike in Iceland. Oh my God, that sounds incredible. Tell us more about Iceland. Was this, was this just the two of you going or were you going as like part of a group? What was it like when you were out there in the land of fire and ice? <laughs> It is a very vast, very unique landscape. It was amazing. Um, we went on our own. We did not have a guide. 
I actually think that it's it's a relatively easy trek to self guide if you're if you're comfortable planning your own meals and packing your own food. Um, and we booked we just booked a series of these little mountain huts, and so you're hiking about twelve to fifteen kilometers a day in between these little huts, like going in and out of the mountains. And it's really amazing. You start, first of all, Iceland is crazy. They have these four wheel drive buses that are lifted that can like ford rivers. So we're taking this crazy bus ride on this, you know, mountain road and it's, it's very bumpy and it's a dirt road. And we're going through these rivers on the bus. And then finally the bus drops you off at this place called Landmanna Lager. And that's a really popular day hiking destination as well um, for people coming from Reykjavik. So we booked a hut there for the night. There's a really cool hot spring and a million really cool day hikes around there. And then the second day is when we actually started the trek in earnest. And the weather can change on a dime in Iceland, which is something that I am not used to. I think in California, we're very lucky because we get a lot of, we get very, very reliable weather forecasts, which is makes it easier to plan a mountain trek. But in Iceland, uh, it might say that it's going to be partly cloudy and then suddenly it's very rainy. So I think the first two days of the trek were very rainy. We were hiking up and down these really colorful, very rounded kind of hilly mountains. It almost looks like the landscape behind me in the photos um, that I've been sharing, it almost looks like they're painted because there, there are so many shades of like orange and brown and green, and there's no trees really on any of the mountains in Iceland. So you get these weird splotches of bright green moss. So you're going up and down, and then you, you, you finally get to this hut that is really, really remote after passing through like a volcanic sand area that looks very lunar and very desolate. And so then you sleep there. The second day, you're going up and down more of these amazing like orange and red painted hills. And um, then finally you go down, down, downhill to this amazing lake called Alftavatn. I feel like I'm going to butcher all of these names. And, um, and there's actually a lot of green around the lake. And so fortunately for us, the sun came out and we did like a little photo shoot at the lake. It was so beautiful. And uh, I'm used to lakes being just above freezing in the Sierras because they're usually snow melt. But this one in Iceland was really comfortable. And so we jumped in and we got to swim in the lake and that was amazing. And um, the next day was pretty rough. We had it was mostly flat trail with these like bizarre rock formations and mountains all around us. And we're hiking on this volcanic sand with these weird veiny purple and white flowers everywhere. And the rain is just coming down in buckets and um, there's like wind that's just battering our face with sand. And um, if I had to guess, I would say the wind was probably easily 50, maybe 50 or 60 miles an hour at times, which is pretty gnarly. So we're very grateful to get to the hut that day and hide inside for the entire evening. The next part of the trek goes up and down these really cool river canyons. And finally, you get to this little town called Thorsmuk, which a lot of people finish their trek in. But if anyone listening is interested in doing this trek, I would highly recommend trying to do the remaining 30 kilometers that go all the way to Skogar because you get to walk through this volcanic caldera from, I think, 2009. There was this big eruption of this volcano in Iceland in 2009 that canceled all those flights. And uh, so you actually get to hike up and into that volcano because it's back to being dormant and safe now. And you can see these black lava fields where there actually used to be lava several years ago. And you hike through the volcano, you stay at a little hut right on the edge. And then the last day, if you add on this extra bit, you see like, gosh, like 50 something waterfalls, I feel like in one day. It's very green. You're hiking along this river. You're meandering in and out of these grassy green little valleys and canyons. And there's just waterfalls as far as the eye can see and wildflowers. And it, it is absolutely breathtaking and magical. And and then the last part of the trek spits you out into civilization and it can feel a little bit jarring. But at the bottom of the, the stairs, right before you get back on the bus, um, is Skogafoss, which is a really famous waterfall. And we got really close to it and got a little bit drenched because we were pretty sweaty and, and tired at that point, And it felt really awesome. <laughs>
it's a tough job, but somebody has got to do it. So thank you for taking one for the team and, and heading out to Iceland. <laughs> what a hype. Yeah. What an experience. I mean, that's obviously definitely going on the bucket list now after, after hearing that. So I believe what I want to do now is I want to switch things up a little bit. I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. So my questions may be quick, but it doesn't mean your answers have to be. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Are you a morning person or an evening person? I used to be an evening person, but now I'm a morning person. I think I've officially switched over into outdoor person hiker mode. So uh, I think in my, probably when I turn right on when I turn 30, I switch. What time does your alarm go off in the morning? Mm, depends on the day. Um, 6.30 if I'm doing yoga. Mm, 7 or 7.30 if I'm sleeping in a little. Tea or coffee? Coffee particular brand no actually I I almost wish I was a coffee snob but I don't think I'm cool enough (laughs) what book are you reading at the moment oh my gosh Sarah I'm reading Shantaram and it is blowing my mind and it makes me want to go back to India favorite movie favorite movie I really love Amelie you know it's been my favorite movie forever and I think it still is what about music do you do you have a favorite musician band genre type of music that you listen to yeah, I've been listening to a lot of folk lately. So I've been really into like the Lumineers. And I've also just always been a huge fan of, I like the White Stripes. I like grunge music a lot. Uh, I really like the Black Keys. And hmm, I like a lot of Riot Girl as well. I was really into Bikini Kill and Slater Kinney and bands like that when I was a bit younger. I have to say, I've, I have not heard of any of those. <laughs> Oh, I love it. That's just more that I think that says more about my music taste than anything else. Let's talk. What about, kind of music do you like? Oh, cheesy pop, like you know, Britney, Beyonce, mm-hmm. Taylor Swift, <laughs> very upbeat and that's poppy. Awesome. Yeah, that's fun though. It is fun. It is fun. I do like. It does get me in a very you know happy dancey mood when I listen to it. Of course, yeah. With regards to food, what's your favorite food in normal life, and what's like your favorite hiking food? Oh, great question. In normal life. I really like, honestly, like I'm just a sucker for pasta, I think. I really like ice cream and pasta. I feel like I'm like a five-year-old. I I eat a lot of pasta and chicken, and then I eat a lot of, I eat a lot of ice cream if I worked out that day. (laughs) And then hiking, I feel like there is a really amazing freeze-dried pad thai that I just discovered that is going to bankrupt me because it's, it's so good. And I want to take it on like every hike. My other my other favorite random little backpacking snack is um, cheese sticks. I think I'm I'm probably a little obsessed with cheese sticks, and I'm eating them constantly on the trail. <laughs> what about your favorite kit or gear? My favorite piece of gear? Yeah. Hmm. Let me think. I have. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, well, because everything everything is so functional in its own way. You know, honestly, I I recently tried out a new tent and. Um, I, I did not care for it. So I have to say my old tent, I think it's really taking the cake right now in terms of what I what I love and, and trying out this new tent really emphasize that. Um, I have an REI quarter dome too, and it is amazing. It has plenty of space to hang out in, like the best pockets. It has two different little doors and vestibules, and I think it weighs three and a half pounds. So it is, it is like the best, in my opinion, it's like the best tent for the money for two people to go backpacking. What do you do for rest and relaxation? I watch a lot of Planet Earth on Netflix right now. (laughs) I have a hard time sitting still. So I often will try to trick myself into doing something where I have to sit still by convincing myself that it is um, recovery. So I'll do things like book a really cheap massage so that I have to sit still for an hour. Or um, I just moved in with my I just moved in with my current boyfriend a month ago and he has a jacuzzi at his house, which is amazing. So I've been doing a lot of jacuzziing the last month. That sounds amazing. (laughs) I feel like that would be high on my list. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's if you're dating someone with a jacuzzi, I mean, that's definitely up there on the list of necessary items. 100%. (laughs) Tick in the right box. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Would you say you're more mountains or more beach? Absolutely more mountains. I do not understand the beach at all. You wouldn't catch yourself there just sort of sunbathing on the beach? No. Heading down to like the LA uh, Santa Monica Pier. I go like maybe once a year. I like to ride my bike on the beach. That's really nice because it's it's pretty close to where I live actually. So I'm fortunate enough to get to do that, but I'm not I'm not very good at sitting still on the beach. Although I do like scuba diving. 
Um, I went to Belize and got recertified a couple of years ago, and that was incredible. So I like the ocean, but maybe just not the beach. (laughs) Do you have like a mantra or a favorite quote that you either sort of live your life by or that's really impacted you and um, that you just love? Yeah, I, I actually, I'll give you, I'll give you two of them. So the one that, that that came from my heart that I think is really important that I focus on a lot is set your comfort aflame, which to me means that the most impactful or important or meaningful things that you're going to do in your life are not going to be in your comfort zone. So getting comfortable being uncomfortable is one of the most important things you can do if you want to achieve big things or go on big adventures. And then the second one that I'll give you is Ram Das, who's a really amazing spiritual teacher, his mantra that he uses and that I've used a lot in meditation and on the trail as well is I am loving awareness. And so just like repeating that in your mind over and over again, especially if you're meditating or if you're having a hard day at work, it really helps you to reframe whatever it is that's bothering you from the perspective of the witness so like, let's say you have a coworker who's really annoying or something. If you can, if you can take a step back and, and do the loving awareness mantra repetition, it helps you, it helps you reframe it so that you can kind of stand outside yourself and see them with compassion and kindness rather than having this like negative reactivity that I think we all often really fall into. So those are two of my favorites. What was the final one? What was, what are those words? I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. Yep. And you just repeat it over and over again, like in a, you know, in a 20 minute meditation or something like that. Emily, I'd love for you to leave some final words of wisdom for other women who want to be brazen. They want adventure. They want to solo travel. They want to get backpacking. What advice would you have um, for those women listening? I would say that today you are younger than you're ever going to be. And um, there's no time like the present to start taking big or small steps towards the things that make your heart smile because we don't get to take any of this with us. And if you're not pursuing your passion while you're here, then what else are you doing? And where can people find more information about you? Where can they follow along with your journey and read more about, you know, read more of your writings? Yeah. So I would say Instagram is probably the best place to find me. I I do a lot of like little mini writings and quotes and things and lots of adventure photos. Um, So it's just at Brazen Backpacker on Instagram, or you can find, you can find more long form writing and adventure stories and tips and tricks on brazenbackpacker.com. And that's my actual website. Emily, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more. Uh, I want to say more about your brazen lifestyle, but uh, more about your adventure and um, your traveling and your backpacking. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing so many awesome tips and pieces of advice. I really do appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. I was thrilled to be here. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Emily. I now just want to give you some top podcast episodes to listen to. So if you love walking, if you love hiking, if you love getting outside, then take a listen to some of our previous guests on the Tough Girl podcast. So you can take a listen to Lindsay Cole, who's an adventurer and storyteller who walked the length of the rabbit proof fence in Australia. You can catch up with Katie Jane Lehupinier, who's a model turned adventurer who walked the entire length of the Great Wall of China. Fiona Quinn, who walked Great Britain, 990 miles solo and unsupported over 57 days she that she then went back and cycled it we've caught up with anna blackwell the goings on of an adventurer walking 500 and 1000 miles across france and spain zoe langley watham walking adventures including the southwest coastal path and the wales coast path take a listen to alex mason who quit her job in 2015 and through hike the pacific crest trail twice you can also take a listen to my podcast episode where i share more about through hiking the appalachian trail 2190 miles in 100 days. You can also take a listen to Cheryl Strayed, who is the writer and author of the New York Times bestseller, Wild. So Cheryl actually came on to celebrate the 100th episode of the Tough Girl podcast. You can also take a listen to Hannah Engelkamp, who walked 1,000 miles, who walked the 1,000 mile circumference of Wales with Chico the donkey. So there are obviously, you know, there are hundreds of episodes of the Tough Girl podcast to listen to. We have walkers, runners, cyclists, mountaineers, sailors, a whole variety of women. 
women out there doing these incredible challenges. So please do go and check out toughgirlchallenges.com. You can find more information about me, the previous guests. Um, you can also find out more information about supporting the couple supporting the tough girl podcast and signing up as a patron it makes a massive difference in allowing me to produce this content you can sign up from two dollars a month to 25 dollars a month so a massive thank you to everybody who's supporting the tough girl podcast i couldn't i could not produce this work without your support and the mission or my mission is to increase the amount of female role models in the media i want to show women out there that women do these challenges and go on those these adventures and actually when women can see other women doing it when women can hear other women doing it I'm hoping it gets you to start to think, well, hold on, what can I do? What is my challenge going to be? How am I going to step outside my comfort zone? How am I going to make sure that I live my life to the fullest? And that's all I want you to do is to live life to the fullest. Give it your all, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, get after it, give it 110%, go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Have an awesome day. I'll speak with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care. Lots of love. Big hugs. Bye.